All right, it's good to see you all here this morning. I think we've got it, we're all worked out, and uh, glad you're here. Am I? Yeah, I'm coming through. All right. I'm already out of breath, and I haven't started singing yet. That's not a good sign. <laughs> here we go.
Hey, good morning. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking while the choir was singing, while we were singing praises this morning, uh, have you ever sat in a restaurant and across the restaurant somebody started singing happy birthday to somebody and you kind of joined in? And it was fun, right? It was kind of cool. But have you ever sang happy birthday to somebody that you truly loved and cherished? I say this morning, if you, if you know the one we're singing about, you should have something totally different than just singing songs, just to be a part of something. And uh, man, what an incredible this morning to be able to sing Hosanna and shouts of praise to the, to the coming King for what he's done for us in his resurrection. This morning, uh, we also get an opportunity to pray uh, for people that we know, which is just, um, you know, I've prayed for people, I'm sure you have too, that just somebody sends a message, hey, pray for them. But once again, somebody that you know personally. Uh, just seems to be something added to it. And if you got a chance to meet Sydney during the GIC, she's up from Verona area and she's been to Africa and she's going back to Africa this summer to work with the Maasai people group there to teach them soccer, obviously just to get an in so that she can spread the love of God to those people. And we're gonna pray for Sydney this morning. We're also praying for uh, Ken Andel's Sunday School class that this uh, afternoon they go to Souls Harbor. And I'll repeat what I said this morning. If you've never been, I've never met someone that's gone to Souls Harbor and come back going, ah, I'm good, that was cool, but I don't want to go back. Everyone comes back saying, oh, when can we go again? When can I go serve? And I believe it's because they served the way God did, the way Jesus did. Met their physical need and then met their spiritual need. And so uh, we pray for them this afternoon, is, uh, this morning for them as they go this afternoon to uh, spread the love of God through feeding those folks and through uh, church service. Would you please bow with me? Father, we thank you so much for this Resurrection Sunday, to be able to celebrate the day that you gave us life by coming back to life. Father, we thank you for what you did at the cross, obviously, and fulfilling the law and, and getting rid of our sin for all eternity. But Lord, it would be, I don't want to say nothing, but Lord, without the resurrection, that's what gives us life after death. And Lord, we celebrate that this morning. We celebrate your birth, your resurrection, uh, your, your death and your resurrection. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray for, for Sydney and I pray for the Sunday School class group this morning that they are telling folks about the resurrection. They're telling people how you died for them. And Lord, you took their sin away and uh, never to be remembered. But Father, you came back from the dead, giving them a hope of eternity after the grave, um, looking forward to it, to live their life now for you and gratefulness and thankfulness and worship to you and what you have done. Father, just bless them, Lord, you pray. You tell us to pray for uh, people to be sent out to the harvest, and that's what we've done, and we see that these people group, have, these, uh, these people like Sydney and Sunday School class are going out into the harvest, um, into the fields, Father. To, I pray you would give them a harvest, Lord. Lord, you have uh, allowed the seed to grow. You allow the seed to be watered by your mercy and through your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I just pray that you would allow them to see a harvest, and so they would give thanks and glory back to you where it's due. We thank you, Lord, this morning for the offering. We pray we would uh, use what you've given us to give back, to bless the world in an incredible way through financial means. And in the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. 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 Let's continue, continue singing this morning.
Resurrection Sunday, a day that we, that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul says that if there is no resurrection, then Jesus was not resurrected. And if Jesus was not resurrected, then, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is useless. Folks, if Jesus was not resurrected, there is no point in anybody being here today or any other day. But because he was resurrected from the dead, then we have a reason to celebrate, uh, a hope uh, for today, and a hope for our future. In Matthew chapter 28, we read Matthew's recording of the events of resurrection morning. Uh, if you need a Bible, there should be one on the left end of your row in that pocket. And if you don't have a Bible uh, to keep, take it with you when you go. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 1, reading from the New Living Translation. Matthew says, Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. There was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled the stone aside and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid, he said. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. Now we need to stop in the story right there. The angel comes down from heaven with an earthquake, blindingly white garment, and rolls the stone back. He does not roll the stone back to let Jesus out. He lets the women in so that they can see that the grave is already empty. Jesus had resurrected himself earlier that day and had left the tomb. The guards were unaware of it until the angel came down and rolled the stone back. So, verse 7, And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And as they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message, uh, and as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, and they grasped his feet and worshipped him, and he said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. And they surely did. This is the reason that we gather today, to celebrate a resurrected Lord, an empty tomb, an empty cross. But folks, three weeks ago, we were wrapping up our global impact celebration for 2024. Some of you are wondering why the flags are still up. Uh, because these two days tie together. And I wanted them up through Resurrection Sunday. Uh, during our Global Impact Celebration, many of us were inspired by the stories of this, uh, this cycle's group of missionaries, which were uh, as amazing as they were diverse. We're praying for Sydney today, a 20-year-old college student who is going to Africa at least the second time to work with the Maasai people. 
an amazing story of a valiant young person uh, just uh, heading off to the ends of her world. Uh, we heard stories from missionaries serving in Eastern Europe where they started a church in a bar uh, in a former communist country, and the bar owner got saved and started telling her patrons, you're drinking too much. <laughs> yeah, it was a little self-destructive, but wonderful, wonderful counsel. Uh, and and we, all these great stories from these wonderful missionaries that were here, and we, we, they, they had traveled such great distances. Uh, they had been on the field, many of them, for decades. Uh, they had gone to countries that aren't safe, uh, that are in the third world or beyond. Uh, they left behind the comfort and safety of the United States uh, to go and to risk their lives to carry the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. The Bible records stories of other men and women who were used by God to show him forth to the nations. If you read through the story uh, of Israel, the, the beginning of Israel as a nation, uh, that's what God purposed them to do. He birthed that people group uh, from Abraham on for the purpose of partnering with him to make him visible to the nations, to the ends of the earth. Uh, if you want to get specific, Jonah was probably the first biblical missionary to travel to a foreign country and to warn people of God's coming judgment. He didn't want to do it, he wasn't happy about doing it, and he didn't like the outcome when God forgave and the people repented, but he went anyway. Uh, in the New Testament, we see the 11 apostles joined by Matthias, who replaces Judas, and these men, according to the Bible and early church tradi traditions, at least attempted to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth as they understand them. Now, depending on who you read and which history it is, some of it varies a little bit, but uh, tradition is pretty staunchly surrounding the fact that Thomas made it to India, which was farther than Alexander the Great got. It was farther than the Romans got. Um, uh, tradition also says that Bartholomew made it to Britain. And, of course, we know the story in Acts of Philip the evangelist who who uh, led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord, who took the gospel back into North Africa, which they viewed as the southern ends of the earth. So they were, they were trying to push it out. And then there's the Apostle Paul, whose burning desire was to get to Spain, which was the western ends of the earth. And I believe firmly that Paul thought that if he could just get to Spain and preach the gospel, Jesus' command to take the gospel to the ends of the earth would have been fulfilled, and he would come back. They just didn't know that there was a whole lot more earth out there than they were aware of. But Paul went with Barnabas first and Silas next, and Timothy came along later, Paul's son in the, in the spirit, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, spiritual son, and then uh, Luke, his biographer, who all were significant in bringing the gospel our direction. Uh, over the course of, of Paul's four missionary, three missionary journeys, scholars estimate that he walked 10,000 miles. I wonder how many pairs of sandals he went through. Uh, walked 10,000 miles in those the courses of those three missionary journeys. And as he did it, it went north up out of the Middle East into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It went west across Turkey and then jumped the Aegean Sea into Macedonia, down into Greece, over into Italy, and just continued to press westward until it was brought here by uh, those that, that uh, colonized this neck of the woods. What strikes me about today is that these people that we've and we could talk about more we could talk about southern baptist missionaries like lottie moon and annie armstrong and bill wallace and and that list is endless uh but they're they're nowhere near the first nor are they anywhere near the top of the list as the greatest missionaries the world has ever known the, a missionary has a dilemma when they go into any people group. They have to learn the language. They have to learn the culture. And then they have to try to communicate the gospel message in a way that those people can understand it within their culture. 
The problem that we have even in this country with that is our culture is changing so quickly that a lot of the things that we have used to communicate the gospel are no longer effective. And, and further, many people in this country have the wrong impression of God altogether. Uh, the, the first thing I want you to get today, folks, is that God is not angry with you. God is not mad at you. He is not poised on the edge of heaven with a lightning bolt in each fist, waiting to zap you for the smallest infraction. That was Zeus, and you learned about him in Greek mythology, which is a complete fiction. And you see this in a lot of the polytheistic religions. The gods were capricious. They were, they were toying with humanity. They loved to put people in irresolvable conundrums where there was a no-win outcome. And, and, and they manipulated and, and played with. They frustrated humanity. That is not the God of the Bible. And so the first thing we need to understand is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. The second thing we need to understand this morning is the fact that God loves you so much that while we were still sinners, Jesus died in our place. That's Romans 5, 8. In the news lately, uh, we, I, I've been reading some just bizarre. I, I, I wake up every morning and wonder, what country am I in? Uh, there, there was a trial, a jury trial going on here in Missouri where two Christians were excluded from being uh, jurors in the trial because they were Christians. And they viewed the, the, uh, the, the defendants, who were lesbians, as sinners. And this, the Supreme Court was commenting on it. They're not ruling on it, but they were commenting on it. And a Supreme Court justice. And, and I wanted to say, yes, we do. But we view the lawyers the same way. We view the judge the same way. We view our congregants the same way. We view our pastors the same way, folks. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray, every one of us to our own, our own way. That the righteousness of, of humanity is of filthy rags. We are all sinners. We're not singling anybody out. We're pointing our, our finger at ourselves as well as everybody else. Scripture's pretty clear on this fact. Humanity is broken. And we run towards sin. One of, one of my favorite places in the Old Testament, I think one that brings incredible clarity to the gospel message, and this Sunday in particular, is in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15... Uh, God hasn't even changed Abraham's name yet. He's still Abram. And he is making a covenant with Abram uh, uh, for uh, possession of the land that he will give his people one day. Abraham doesn't even have, he never owns a square foot of Canaan. Never gets one square foot of it. He has to buy a place to get buried and so he never inherits this promise. This is a promise to the future. But God is, 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 is cutting a covenant with humanity in this moment. And, and, it, and it shows us the heart of God. Now, when we talk about a covenant, uh, we, that's usually the term we use when we talk about being a contract. Well, in, in the Bible, they talk about cutting a covenant. And that's what you find here in Genesis 15. And it, it, it's a it's a detailed description of cutting a covenant. And so God says, go out and gather up this certain group of animals, kinds of animals, and I want you to sacrifice. I want you to cut them nose to tail, split them in half in mirror image. And folks, if you've never butchered an animal, that's no small task. And, and then they lay these, these animal halves nose to nose into a furrow in the ground. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, what do we have there? We have a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. These five animals, nose to nose, mirrored halves, going down through this trench, and they're bleeding out into the furrow in the ground. 
So the two men who are making the covenant will take off their sandals and they will walk through the mud and the blood and it will splash up on the hem of their garment. So every morning when they get dressed, they see the blood stain on their clothes and they remember the promise that they made and this, this covenant that they make together is if I don't live up to my end, then what we've done to these animals you can do to me. I will give my blood, my life's blood, to pay for my failure. Well, it says there that Abraham gets this all done, and as the sun was setting, he fell into a deep and uneasy sleep. Folks, I want you to take courage today, because you are not the first person to fall asleep in church. Now, Abraham did it right here in chapter 15, and in this deep and uneasy sleep, God walks the blood path for himself and for Abraham. So God says, if I don't keep my end of the covenant, which I really can't do, I can't not do this, I'm going to keep it, uh, uh, you can kill me. But humanity, if you don't keep your end of this covenant, you can kill me. It is the reason for the incarnation. God has to be mortal. And it is the purpose, the redemption of humanity. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece that we don't go to very often. And so we, it helps us to understand why Jesus had to come in the first place. Now, uh, so, so God, in, in, in walking this path for both parties, commits himself to die should either party break the covenant. Now, humanity has already been breaking the covenant since Genesis chapter 3. David says, I was sinful from my mother's womb. Man, from the time the doctor caught me, I've been sinning ever since. And we have, folks, we have. We have a long-standing tradition as human beings of being sinful. And this is why we need a Savior. Uh, we have continued to break covenant with God ever since. In, in 1 John chapter 1, God says, if you will confess your sins... He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Folks, that wasn't given to people praying the sinner's prayer. That's given to the church. That even as the redeemed, we are still sinful people and we still need forgiveness. God already knew sin was going to be a problem even before he created the world. I like to say at this point that he knew how much we would cost him and he chose to create us anyway. Now, folks, just be glad that he's God and I'm not because if I was God, I would have never made you guys. The price was too high. You're too expensive. You are too high maintenance. I would have made a beautiful planet Earth. I would have made a wonderful golden retriever and an endless supply of clean tennis balls. You know, and we'd have played catch forever. Uh, but, but God knew. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, I'll put it on screen for you. It says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. Folks, wrap your brain around that. Before he ever spoke the first atoms that would become the, 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 the molecules that would become the compounds that would make up dirt and water and air, Jesus had already been set aside to redeem us before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. So we can see what God had done. And today we celebrate that God loved us so much that he took on human form so that we might crucify him on a cross that he might pay the price 
for our sin, the covenant that we broke. Uh, Friday night, the Good Friday service, Brother uh, Rich Cummings from Emmanuel talked about a Twitter thing that was going on Thursday or Friday where someone had, had referred to, to Easter in some way, and I forget what it was exactly, uh, but they got this argument on Twitter over who killed Jesus. And there were, there were groups that were blaming the Jews, and, and, and folks, I, I want to tell you, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. The, the Romans didn't kill Jesus. We killed Jesus. If you want to know who it was, Find another human being, and, and, and the two of you were complicit in it. We're all complicit in the murder of Jesus. Every single one of us, because of our individual sin, we drove the nails into his hands and his feet that pinned him to that cross, that caused him to shed his blood to pay the price for our sin that we can't pay. We killed Jesus. This selfless act... God enables us to be reunited with God whom we have each failed and we continue to fail. The good news today is that death had no ability to keep Jesus in the grave. And on that first resurrection morning, Jesus, who is our Messiah and our Savior, walked alive and well out of that borrowed tomb, victorious over sin, victorious over death, and victorious over the grave. The simple truth about the first coming of Jesus, who is the Christ, the anointed one, he was chosen for this role before the foundation of the earth was laid, is that he came out of a love for sinners to redeem that which was lost, and to demonstrate God's great grace. Grace is unmerited favor, favor that we can't deserve, that we can't earn, that we can't buy, that we can't fabricate. Unmerited favor by offering us the free gift of salvation. And a lot of people struggle with this. They don't understand grace. Now, folks, I, I want... I, I want you for a moment to, to, to work with me on this, okay? We're going to pretend right now that nobody in this room has a car or a motorcycle or a bicycle. Everywhere you go, you got to go like Paul did and you got to walk. And I am the only person in here that has a car. And I have a 2014 Hyundai Santa Fe Sport 2-liter turbo. The engine blows up every 80,000 miles. So it's been replaced once, and the next time it'll be on me because it'll be out from under warranty and the results of the class action suit. But I have a car, and it runs. It's dirty inside and out. It has my tools in the back. It's got trash in the middle. And on a good day, somebody might be able to sit in the passenger seat, but nobody ever does. And so I'm going to take my 2000, because you don't have any transportation at all, I'm going to take my 2014 Hyundai uh, Santa Fe Sport uh, with the clear coat peeling off because that's what all our cars do, right? Uh, drive them off the lot and the clear coat starts like it. And, and I'm going to offer that to you and, and oh, there's the title. I'm going to offer you the signed title to my car. It's paid for. It's not the greatest car that ever was, but hey, you're walking. So if you want my car, here's the signed title, here are the keys, it's paid for, Come and get it. Now, if this were a sincere offer, which it's not, <laughs> any one of you who wanted to could come up and have a free car, right? So if you just sit there like a bump on a log and you don't come and get it, whose fault is that? Hmm? It's your own fault. It was a legitimate offer. Might have been a legitimate offer. This. And, and it was free, and it was paid for, and it could be yours. But you can think of a thousand reasons why you shouldn't come get my car. Well, folks, God saw your problem. He saw my problem, that we were sinners, and that we needed a Savior. And he sent his son to take on human form and to die on a cross and to shed his blood to pay the price for our sin. He did all the work. 
And he brings us the perfect gift of salvation. And he says, I've paid for this. You you don't deserve it. But I love you so much I want you to have it. And he offers it to us. Folks, if you don't take it, whose fault is that? No, 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 no. It's ours. Because the gift is free. The gift of grace. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. And Jesus says, what's more, you can't get back to the Father without it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's no other way to get there but the free gift that Jesus offers. I want to tell you something, folks. People get mad at God for sending people to hell. God has not ever sent anyone to hell. We go to hell by our own choice, our rejection of the gift that he provided at all of the expense to himself and none of the cost to you. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Folks, we do not have any guarantees of how long we're going to live on this earth. We all assume it's going to be 120 or more. But it's not. You don't have any guarantees that you will have a moment beyond this moment. Today, this is the moment. This is the hour. This is the time when the gift of salvation is available for you to claim. If you walk out of here today leaving that gift on the altar, it is not God's fault. And if the shot clock expires, then that's on you. That's on you. Jesus was the greatest missionary of all time. He left the safety and the comfort of heaven. He traveled the greatest distance any missionary has ever gone from heaven to earth. He lived a sinless life, which no missionary has ever done, and he gave his life on a cross for the sins of humanity. He arose from the dead on the third day so that we might have eternal life. Jesus' first coming, folks, was all about grace and reconciliation. Read the Gospels. He's constantly reaching out to sinful people. The woman caught in the act of adultery, the Samaritan woman who had been married six times and was living with the guy she wasn't married to currently, tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew, and just all kinds of sinful people. If Jesus had showed up in Castleville this morning, you know where he wouldn't be? Here. He'd be looking for those lost sheep to reveal himself to them. His first coming was all about grace. I have not come to judge. It was a, his first coming was a judgment-free zone. The harshest words he had were for religious people who were impeding people's ability to get to God. But his next coming will be one of reward for the saved and of judgment for those who have rejected his grace. Because he is a just God. He is a holy God. And sin has to be held in account. And if you don't take his gift of forgiveness of your sin, then that sin is on you and you will pay for it. Forever. In a devil's hell. But it brings us back to John 3.16. That outcome is unnecessary. For this is how God loved the world. Look at the big terms. The world. He didn't love a few. He didn't love the good people. He didn't love people of a particular race or love people of, that, that were like, dressed like this or had that color hair. He loved the world. The world. It's not talking about the earth. It's talking about the people on it. That he gave his one and only son so that everyone, the, the Greek word there is the Greek word for any. There's 23 different Greek words for any, and this is the big one. It's three letters, P-A-S, and it means everybody. Everybody, whosoever, all. It's the same word that, that Paul used when he said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
It's a big word. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It is a gift. It is free. You can't add anything to it. But folks, the choice is up to you. God has paid for it. But you have to claim it. If you don't get the keys and the title, you don't get the car. The choice is up to you. He's not going to twist your arm and force you to love him. So this morning, the ultimate question here is how will you respond to the message of the greatest missionary who's ever lived? Today is the day. And this is the hour appointed to salvation, folks. Don't miss out because you think you've got another 80 or 90 years because that is not promised. Let's pray.